Philippines' worst flooding in decades. Look it up. The stream reached waste levels in a short time. The destructive power of torrential rain, how some people sought higher ground, and the warning of what's on the way. The battle for battleground states this Wednesday night. The competing campaigns and how Kamala Harris is in damage control over something Joe Biden said. First of all, he clarified his comments. Potential jolt, how the U.S. election could affect Canada's energy sector. And nightmare on a Quebec street. Whenever I'm not at work, I'm here. One man's spectacular labor of love. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin in Spain where torrential rain triggered the country's deadliest flash flooding in decades. At least 95 people are known to have died. Others are still missing. And residents cannot believe what the torrents of muddy water has done to their villages. They say the water rose so fast, many could not escape and were trapped in their homes and cars. This woman and her dog among the lucky to be rescued. In some areas of southern and eastern Spain, a year's worth of rain fell in just eight hours. People in Spain who have endured severe drought were praying for rain, but not like this. Redmond Shannon has our top story tonight. Searching for the missing in mud and swamps underneath where the streets of this town used to be. The destruction caused by relentless rain that is hard to fathom, that caught so many by surprise. Among them, a truck driver rescued by firefighters treading against the lethal torrents. The suddenness of the downpour caused havoc and chaos on roads. Many commuters stuck in their cars as water levels rose and rose, sweeping vehicles down streets like bath toys. Parts of Valencia, Spain's third largest city, left in chaos. Residents were effectively trapped like rats, said the mayor of this town. This bakery owner says he climbed out a window after suddenly finding himself up to his shoulders in water. The Spanish king offered sympathies to families of the dead and those who've lost their homes. He and the country's political leaders admit it's still difficult to know how many have died. Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez warned that more rains are coming in other regions. There is already anger at authorities for sending out emergency alerts too late on Tuesday night. Just telling people that it's going to rain quite a lot is not good enough. People don't understand what to do. Spain's recent droughts made it even more difficult for the land to absorb the rain. This man says he spent all night perched on top of a shelving unit. It was a living hell, he says, but I won't cry. A resilient spirit Spain will need in the coming days and weeks. Redmond Channel Global News, London. Estimating the influence of climate change on any single flood event does require analysis, but it is well established global warming is making storms in many regions more intense. Warmer air can retain more moisture and that results in more intense rainfall. The UN Environment Programme calls the Mediterranean a climate change hotspot. The surface of the Mediterranean Sea reached its highest ever recorded temperature in August, 28.9 degrees Celsius. This week, cold air descended over that warm water, causing hotter, moist air on the surface to rise quickly, form dense, towering cumulonimbus clouds in a matter of hours, and they dumped torrential amounts of rain on parts of Spain. If you're counting down, there are now six days until the U.S. presidential election. And if you believe the opinion polls, the two candidates are in a virtual tie. According to 538, which aggregates polls, Kamala Harris is at 48 percent. Donald Trump is at 46.7 percent, which is in within the margin of error, meaning either one could win. In two swing states where Harris held rallies today, Pennsylvania and North Carolina, Trump holds a slight edge in the latest polls, which explains why. Harris is making her case to voters there. And in these final days, as Jackson Prosco reports, it is a fight for a few thousand votes. In the same state, at the same time, the candidates hit the stump, separated by less than 100 kilometers. Make no mistake, we will win. 
I can't believe it, said Lois Reyes. Not, not that I, you know, I just can't believe it. It's the clearest sign yet of a race so impossibly tight, it may be decided by just a few thousand voters in one or two swing states. From here on out, every moment matters. Good evening, America! Kamala Harris had hers Tuesday night in Washington, speaking to an estimated crowd of 75,000 outside the White House, where she outlined key policy proposals in prime time. We have to stop pointing fingers and start locking arms. But an unforced error by President Joe Biden may have stolen the night. The only garbage I see floating out there is his supporters. His, his, his demonization of is unconscionable and it's un-American. Biden was reacting to these comments from a comedian at Trump's Sunday rally. There's literally a floating island of garbage in the middle of the ocean right now. Yeah, I think it's called Puerto Rico. The White House later said the president was only referring to the comedian. Joe Biden finally said what he and Kamala really think of our supporters. The Republican candidate quickly pounced, even though he has regularly denigrated Democrats. We have an enemy from within. Still, it was enough to force Harris onto cleanup duty at a critical moment. Let me be clear, I strongly disagree with any criticism of people based on who they vote for. Even as the race remains a dead heat, there are signs the real battleground will be the courts. The U.S. Supreme Court has upheld a decision by Virginia's Republican governor that removes hundreds of supposedly non-citizen voters from the rolls. While in Pennsylvania, Trump's team filed a lawsuit alleging that voters were turned away on the last day of mail-in ballot requests. Both lawsuits are seen as early ammunition in Trump's efforts to sow doubt about the outcome of the election. Donna? All right, Jackson Prosco in Washington, thanks. A little later, we'll look at how Canada's energy sector is preparing for the outcome of the U.S. election. And on Tuesday, we'll have live coverage of America Votes, a Canadian perspective on this election. We'll be streaming live from Washington, D.C., beginning at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, wherever you watch global news. That includes BC1, globalnews.ca, YouTube, the Global TV app, Pluto TV, and Prime. Well, it seems there will be no secret ballot among Liberal MPs to decide on the future of the party's leader, Justin Trudeau. Instead, at their caucus meeting today, they got a presentation from the party's new campaign director on the plan to beat the Conservatives in the next election. And as Mackenzie Gray reports, at this stage, it will be Trudeau leading the charge. It's a question even some Liberals still have. Many MPs, not just myself, many MPs who've spoken on the record believing that a secret ballot is the, is the best way to move forward. And I think the question should be asked to the Prime Minister if he supports a secret ballot, and if not, why not? I think there should be a secret ballot. But the majority of Liberals talking publicly still back Justin Trudeau. Our party likes our leader. Don't kid yourself. A lot of this is propaganda that's ongoing. The money, although not everyone does, including over 20 of Trudeau's own MPs, who last Wednesday during their private caucus meeting told him he should quit. When the doors closed on this week's caucus, less dissension. The prospect of a secret ballot vote on Trudeau's leadership wasn't raised by a single MP. And for those who want one, they don't have a mechanism to force it. But that doesn't mean the issue is dead. And I think there's a lot of people that are, are still looking for some answers for those things. And, and I think until that's addressed, the, that's going to be lingering. I don't have any other comment. Thank you. Thank you. Some answers provided to Liberals by Andrew Bevan, their new campaign director, who briefed MPs about his monumental task getting the Liberals out of a double-digit polling deficit to the Conservatives. We've sort of brought a, a knife to a gunfight so far on, in how we're approaching advertising and how we're approaching the campaign in general. Expect Bevan to launch new attack ads against the Conservatives soon, just like they've been running against Trudeau for months, who Pierre Pauly have made clear today he wants to run against. They can't just throw him out. He can't just run away. They need to face the music. Why won't we have a carbon tax election now? But as much as Pauly have wants that, it seems unlikely to happen soon, with the NDP seemingly in no rush to vote against the Liberals. We'll look at any bill that comes forward, any motion that comes forward, and if it's going to help people, with these difficult times, we'll look at that. The Conservatives spent 22 times more on ads than the Liberals last year, and it seems to have helped them, with recent Angus Reid polling showing the Prime Minister is the least like federal leader, Donna, unpopular with every age group and gender across every province. Mackenzie in Ottawa, thanks. 
The federal government says it is aware a Canadian has been killed in Russia. He was reportedly fighting for Ukraine and may have been involved in a cross-border raid into Russia. This is the first Canadian killed inside Russia since the launch of the full-scale invasion. Defense spending under scrutiny. Coming up, what the budget watchdog says Canada needs to do to meet NATO's target. Canada's promise to meet NATO's military spending target is as far off as ever. A new report from the Parliamentary Budget Office says the federal government will have to nearly double its defense spending to reach its goal by 2032. Canada hasn't met the NATO target of spending a minimum of 2% on defense in years. And as Mercedes Stevenson reports, there is no sign that's going to change soon. Facing extraordinary pressure from allies to spend more on defense, Justin Trudeau finally committed to meeting the NATO defense spending target back in July. Canada fully expects to reach NATO's 2% of GDP spending target by 2032. But Canada's budget watchdog says the numbers aren't adding up. It's really strange to use these. Now the parliamentary budget officer says the government got its math wrong and that Canada is billions of dollars short. For them to get this off by such an important amount is very unusual. The PBO says that instead of spending 2% of GDP, the government's numbers only add up to 1.58%, or about 20% short of the target. The projected gap in real dollars, more than 20 billion annually. A significant difference that would mean approximately doubling defense spending. Former Chief of the Defence Staff Tom Lawson says the government's figures amount to a mathematical sleight of hand. The PBO report uh, that smoke is cleared, the mirrors are broken, and uh, it's seen for what it is. But Defence Minister Bill Blair defended the government's math, saying they used the NATO standard. The spending metric that we've agreed to with NATO is based on the NATO calculation of every member's GDP. That's the, the, the standard that they have set, and that's the standard we've committed to and are working towards. Analysts say the audit's findings are an open secret. What's the difference of another $10 billion below where you're supposed to be at between friends? Um, we, everybody knows that we aren't anywhere really close. But here's the twist. With a potential Trump presidency around the corner, the push for more defense spending could become more urgent. They said, well, if we don't pay, are you still going to protect us? I said, absolutely not. They couldn't believe the answer. In Canada, defense spending isn't a vote winner, though, in any pending election. And neither the Liberals or Conservatives are anxious to put their money where their mouth is when it comes to defence. Mercedes Stevenson, Global News, Ottawa. India is being singled out as an emerging threat to Canada's cybersecurity. A new report from the Federal Cyber Centre says Canada is dealing with a growing list of malicious and unpredictable cyber threat actors who are, in its words, seizing any opportunity to leave a mark. Canada and in, in, in India potentially may have some tensions. It is possible that we may see uh, India want to flex those uh, cyber threat actions against Canadians. Prime Minister Trudeau and the RCMP have linked India's government to serious and violent crimes against six separatists in Canada. The report says Russia and Iran also pose a significant threat to Canada. China is the most active, compromising at least 20 networks linked to the Canadian government. Ransomware is the top cyber crime threat facing Canada's infrastructure, partly due to the growing intensity and sophistication of artificial intelligence. An Ontario man has been charged after a deadly boat crash near Kingston five months ago on the Maylong weekend. Three young adults were killed and five other people were taken to hospital after a speedboat ended up on top of a fishing boat on Bob's Lake. 44-year-old Matthew Splinter faces a dozen charges related to dangerous and impaired operation of the boat. Tragically, three lives were lost that day and serious injuries. And with the resources involved in this, I wanted to ensure that a fulsome and fair investigation was brought forward to the courts. The suspect is being held in custody and will be back in court on Friday to set a date for a bail hearing. Billions at stake ahead how Canada's energy sector is bracing for a potential jolt from the U.S. election.
Two New York Yankees fans tried taking things into their own hands during Game 4 of the World Series last night. They ripped a foul ball out of the glove of L.A. Dodgers outfielder Mookie Betts while he was trying to catch it. The fans' plan didn't work. The Dodgers were awarded the out. The fans were kicked out of the game. The Yankees call it egregious and unacceptable and have revoked the fans' tickets for tonight's game as well. Those involved in Canada's energy sector are watching the U.S. election campaign closely. Last year, 97 percent of our country's crude oil exports went to the U.S. A change in policy from a new president could put billions of dollars on the line. That's why Alberta has its own representative working behind the scenes in Washington. Heather Urex West on what the industry is preparing for. It didn't take long after the last U.S. election for Canada's energy industry to take a direct hit. With the stroke of a pen, President Joe Biden honoured a campaign promise to cancel the Keystone XL pipeline, wiping out billions in potential earnings on this side of the border, along with thousands of jobs. That window closed, Keystone is gone, nobody's proposing another pipeline like that in any serious way. Four years later, the stakes for Canada's energy industry remain high, even if proposed policies on either side of the aisle have changed. Any election is obviously of huge importance to Alberta. Former Conservative MP James Rajat has been representing Alberta's interests in Washington since 2020. But whether it's Harris or Trump entering the White House next, he says his office's strategy in the lead up to this election has been the same. I think what we're watching for within both parties is sort of increasing protection of sentiment in terms of buy America, buy American. What we have to do is obviously communicate to American policymakers that we are very integrated and we can't set up barriers between the two countries. The U.S. and Canada have the world's most important bilateral energy trading relationship. So uh, understandably, I think the idea that there might be uh, tariffs is, is very concerning. Because right now we have a if very elected, tough... Donald Trump is proposing a 10 percent tariff on all imports into the U.S., and while Harris has been critical of that idea, she has yet to release details of her own tariff plans. If that meant a 10% tariff on our oil and gas and electricity exports, I mean, that would be quite problematic for Canada because we have 90% plus of those things going to the U.S. market and we have no alternatives. Even with the expanded Trans Mountain Pipeline opening access to markets abroad, Canada's energy sector remains reliant on the giant it sleeps beside. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. House of Horrors next. The spooky scene taking over a neighborhood in Quebec. Dear Lord, can you go into the basement? Yeah. Oh, look at these guys. They aren't your typical passengers. Dawson and Pacey are alpacas from Rockton, Ontario. Not just any alpacas, they are ambassadors of this year's Royal Agricultural Winter Fair in Toronto, and they're embracing the fair's slogan, when country comes to the city, riding the GO train and greeting commuters. The fair kicks off on Friday. There's some sad news from the Toronto Zoo. A western lowland silverback gorilla has died. The gorilla, which the zoo named Charles, had been at the zoo since it opened in 1974. He charmed millions of visitors for decades with his impressive stature and presence. The zoo says Charles had been experiencing heart issues since late last week. His condition then suddenly deteriorated before he died on Tuesday. He was 52. Western lowland silverback gorillas typically live 30 to 40 years in the wild. Well, if you haven't carved the pumpkin, picked up the costume, or bought the candy yet, you are running out of time. Little ghosts and vampires may be showing up at your door tomorrow, but in Longay, Quebec, there is one home that the littlest ones may want to steer clear of. It's dubbed the Nightmare on Empire Street. Braden Jager Haynes explains why. Under the shroud of darkness, it's difficult to tell what's real and what's not. These trauma-inducing scenes of fear are the creations of the maniacal mastermind Alain Levesque. You know, it started with something simple to amuse, amuse my kids and to amuse the neighborhood. And from there, it basically grew up and it became a passion. Fueled by popular demand, Levac and his family have put on this freak show for the past 13 years. The nightmare on Empire Street has expanded in scale and popularity over the years, 
even taking over the next door neighbor's front lawns. Oh, I, my entire, the entire month of October is, is busy, busy. When I, whenever I'm not at work, I'm here. So all my free time is spent on that. She just can't wait for Halloween to be over to have her, uh, her husband back. And her yard. <laughs> and her yard, yeah, yeah. A labor of love. All the props are handmade with basically recycled material. It takes about ABC two months pipes, to plan and uh, set up this spooktacular. Is that word a sign of party? From the mechanical to the technical, the Halloween bug has inspired and spread to nearby neighbors, putting on their own show. Complete fun, magic, and uh, mystery to give life to inanimate objects. It is for him. I think it's also a neighborhood and community thing that brings. It's a little magical time every uh, every year. With record warm temperatures in the forecast, it's expected some 3,000 trick or treaters will visit this house of horrors this Halloween. And we have these regulars that come every year. You know, it becomes like a big circus. People want to see, okay, what do you have this year? You know, you know, show us, show off off your skills. You know, what do you, what, what, what's, what's new? You know. Always aiming to please and put on a good scare. Levac says he has lots more in store for years to come. Braden Jagger Haynes, Global News, Longueuil. Hard to match that one. That is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is Ghoul's Night Out, a treasured tradition at Calgary's Heritage Park. We'd love to see Your Canada. Please email it to globalnational at globalnews.ca. And thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye-bye.